kind of words. And I will, of course, talk about our work, but uh, it's not only our work, it's also, you will see parts of our students' work and parts of the research we are doing at the ETH. I had the pleasure to meet originally uh, critics at ETH in the last uh, several years, so uh, there was a certain interest growing to what's actually happening in Russia. It's the first time in Russia now, and we um, arrived last Sunday, had until now really interesting, intense days, and uh, me as also my assistants and students are, I think we can say that, very inspired by a lot of things. So, to talk about uh, the old work is all the time difficult. You have to somehow find a method how, how it is um, interesting to tell it to other people. And what I try to do now, I have, of course, a title. You see here, Permanence and Change. And I have uh, eight topics. And Permanence and Change is, um, I think, the more important one. Because um, last Friday we had a big um, party because we are 30 years old as an office. And you know, so that means we are now 30 years um, in the business, uh, doing competitions, studies, sometimes winning, sometimes losing. Uh, we started to teach. 2012, and you know, there is a you know, looking back, there is a kind of interesting observation that there are things which stay as field of interests, which don't, which just even after 30 years are still present. But then remembering how I studied and remembering and, and seeing now we were just visiting the studios here this afternoon. I mean, there are really challenges coming every year with every project, uh, and that means uh, it is important to keep up the curiosity and also to be open to change. So, permanence and change. I have these eight topics, these eight themes, and you see a lot of them are all related to space. There are some others, as the last, the second half of it. And um, every of these topics I will describe or pre precisely um, a little bit with um, examples of, of our projects uh, or teaching activity. Uh, you will see the following. Starting light in space. All of you know that uh, Pantheon in Rome. 120 after Christ. I hope you know it also in reality. It's an incredible space. It's also a very absolute space in terms of it hasn't lost any fascination for architects over centuries. And it is maybe um, also the, the space who can, as here, be the symbol for this topic. So, in our work, it is, um, it is linked to our group of works we did, the museums, in the, especially in the 90s when we started. We had the luck in 1989 to start the office, and our first project was a museum. It was this museum, I guess you know it, or some of you know it. You see, it's a... Uh, 89 and 92, it was a competition. We were very young, uh, hardly 30 years old. Um, we got the chance to participate in it because we did a study for this uh, museum uh, just by ourselves. We pro proposed it to the institution and to the community and then they invited us to the competition. As you see it here, it's 
it's a kind of a pavilion. Uh, there are uh, uh, rooms, or let's say volumes, put together in a, in a certain way, and having a kind of lower volume linking these, you see it now as three volumes, linking these together to a building. It has a certain materiality, I will show you afterwards, which um, um, obviously has a big affinity with natural light that is outside now. If you look at the plan and the sections, you see there are not three rooms, but four rooms, and they are put together in, in, a, in a kind of precise way. I maybe can show you. Ah, here. In a precise way that they, are, that they stay independent. Here there is their entrance. And um, in the section, the articulation between these four spaces and the space in between is, let's say, the, the whole concept, the, the, the DNA of this uh, project. It is a museum in the mountains, so five months in the year there is no lane horizontally. So it, is, it was obvious, or let's say it was a kind of um, a rational decision to keep the roof closed, to create a kind of light space above the exhibition spaces and having light coming in from the vertical, um, the vertical windows uh, around forming uh, these uh, light spaces above the exhibition spaces. And the result are these two, let's say, very uh, contradictory rooms. There is this kind of ideal uh, space with this translucent ceiling with a very equal light on one hand, dedicated to the art, and there is this very interesting unequal in lighted space in between, materialized in concrete, being present in the ceiling, walls, and um, um, on the ground. And, you know, experiences this building, you pass from one room to the, to the other all the time through this in-between space. And, um, so this was the starting point. It, it was a kind of, um, how, how can I say, it's, it's, you know, late 90s. We studied at the ETH. I'm coming over the Netherlands, back to Switzerland. Annette uh, was uh, first working in Zurich and then had uh, quite an intense time with Herzog Tömero. And there was also, uh, let's say, the in the, from the middle, from 85, there were the first modern, uh, post-modernistic buildings um, in Germany, uh, especially in France, and there was a big discussion in Switzerland. So how do you make a museum dedicated to one artist? The artist you see is Ernst Ludwig Kirch, Kirchner, uh, the German expressionist. How do you do that? And it is, um, in a way, not so much dedicated, let's say, to the way of painting to Ernst Ludwig Kirches, but more in a kind of way, how can we um, design uh, spaces which can be used in very different uh, ways. So, it, of course, it's closely linked to the so-called white cube. It is also a kind of co very conceptual project. It is in a way, it was also a little bit naive, but uh, we, we, um, we still think it was a big uh, chance to do this building and also to do it in this pure way. Because the following one, and it really was, you see, 93, it was just following the Kirchner Museum, was in a way an opposite, uh, the opposite. It was a complete other challenge, but with the same, let's say, topic of light, uh, and space, um, it, the condition was to build as much square meters 
of art space, of exhibition space of a high quality for a very low budget. It was meant to be a building for 10, 12 years and then being uh, replaced through a, through a real exhibition of the museum. So the original museum is this building here. You see it, it is a kind of classical building of the, of, of the turn of the century. And it has this kind of rectangular shape, nine spaces just beside each other, not anymore in between spaces, just like a, um, like a kind of, uh, of, of very simple um, layout. And there is a very regular grid above it of um, shed-like, north-orientated, um, um, a north orientated filter which um, lets let the, 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 the light falling into the in, into the uh, uh, spaces. It is elevated because there is a parking field on the ground floor. We couldn't change that. There were some kind of contracts between the city uh, and the museum itself. So that is the result of that. Uh, it is a steel construction. Um, there is a poured horizontal floor from the ground floor to the first floor. It is inside uh, completely cladded with chips and blocks, huge chips and blocks. Everything is more or less jointless. Uh, the cladding of the shed uh, structure is also in chips and on the as opposition, the outside appears as an industrial, as an industrial thought uh, building in the way that uh, the elevation is assembled uh, by industrial, industrialized, standardized uh, products. Uh, you see the, uh, the horizontal, you know, you see the vertical U-shaped um, uh, glass elements, which you know from agriculture, but also industrial complexes. And behind these horizontal cassettes where the insulation is in it and just directly mounted on, on, on the uh, steel construction. The joints of these glass elements were open to guarantee natural ventilation on the ground floor for the parking. Above it is really a kind of closed, um, a closed surface uh, to protect, let's say, the, the inner isolation and the, let's say, the, the interior spaces. Above the shed, you see the light in itself is quite, is only half of the shed. We precisely calculated it that this uh, light coming down from the north is not too much, is not, um, not, um, let's say, uh, too less, but it, it, it has a, a, a precise a consistency within a space when the, the sky is uh, cloudy. And the third, you see, 96, the third uh, museum in, 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 in similar size is this one. And you can already from the model um, that is the main model, which was then going to be built. These are the, let's say, the, the row of, of study models um, where you can see that there is not anymore this kind of filter, this kind of rhythmic sequence of the sheds, which has a kind of industrial touch, which was right in the city um, of Winterthur, uh, of the museum you just saw before. Here it is it is one uh, beautiful skylight, one big shed per space. So when we look now in the section, you see that the addition of the spaces, of the rooms which are smaller, are all the time going together with this kind of asymmetrical roof. Again, an orientation to the north and because there is a kind of sequence of, from the sizes, from the bigger rooms to the smaller ones, and then 
yeah, a circulation which has a kind of diagonal and sometimes um, a kind of coming after itself and then going back with interruptions of spaces with windows where you have direct looks outside, an entrance hall where you have a shed to the south that you have a kind of entering the room having a very warm atmosphere of light and then going to the ex exhibition spaces uh, just meeting their light atmosphere which are uh, the, the, the contrary, which are let's say the, the, the light from the the Nordic light. The spaces have also sometimes windows. The windows have the, let's say, are in the same dimensions as uh, the openings uh, from, from room to room. And there is all, all the time also a certain balance from what a kind of light is coming from above and what kind of light I have, uh, let's say, after three rooms which are enclosed, to have an orientation to the outside. So it is a kind of going through, having sometimes an orientation to outside, being interrupted by a room without any skylight, only with a big window um, um, to look outside. So this, this is this kind of last uh, solution, especially in section of these three uh, museums. It is cladded in this case uh, with steel plates, steel plates in the size of about 90, um, 90 uh, centimeters to 100 centimeters. They are, um, they are not polished. It, it is a kind of matte surface, but is, it has again, unlike the glass, a very nice affinity to, to the light, to the outside light, direct light, but also light coming from a certain angle and, um, uh, and formulating or modulating um, uh, the structure of the surface. The next topic, material and space. It was from the beginning, and it's maybe also it was a kind of natural way to get into the, let's say, into, into building, into choosing materials, finding concept of how to put them together, thinking about joints, and also to think about sustain sustainability of the materials, how they get older, and so on. So this was at the same time as Light and space, it was just a very important topic. I, don't, I, I will show now other examples, but of course the, the projects could be also ordered um, in, um, in other groups. Janus Kuenelis, you know him, a work um, from the 60s, coal and steel, black steel with heat traces, and that language, this kind of presence of material, although it's 20 years, 25 years before we did this project, Arte Povera, as a kind of contra movement to the, uh, to the, to the um, um, minimal art, it, it, it is still and was, especially at this time, a very uh, influential world. I link it now to this project which happened in 89 until 2002. It was also a competition about a topic which was really challenging. It was uh, the place of a battlefield where the first time the Romans were beaten by the Germans, by German tribes. It was you can say it was a kind of first step to the German na nationalization. It was, um, it's called the, the Varus Battle. It was not clear that it is really the, the place uh, uh, of the battle itself, but it was clear that here something happened in a bigger scale. So th there were um, gravings, there were a big amount of small findings, and the, let's say the, 
the program was to find, on one hand, methods of how can I transform the nature in such a way that you can, you know, that you can have an idea how it was at this time. And it, uh, it was really, uh, the battle was um, about uh, zero Christ, so it was it was really uh, in the early times, and you see here a drawing which has quite some transformations of the woods in cutting them back, but also enlarging their volumes. Um, you know that the, the, the German tribes were hiding here; they were they were building some kind of earth ramps here, and. The, the Roman legions were passing by, there was a kind of a swamp area here, inaccessible. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, in the winter, very rainy, very slippery, and that was, let's say, this geographical moment um, was the reason um, why I think they um, could win over the much more sophisticated armed uh, Romans. So the nature, the park, is one thing, and the other one is how can you invent buildings to reinforce the history? To re reinforce the history, let's say, in contemporary times, but also um, designing a museum where you just very simple could show in a decent way the findings. What we have chosen first is this rusty steel material being present for every intervention, every built intervention. And the interventions are not only buildings, there are some buildings, like this one, right, the museum and the tower, where you could look um, all over the topography, but also pavilions. Also, let's say, some kind of posts indicating the battle line, but also pathways. And, um, Coming to the museum itself, all these buildings, pavilions, but also the museum, they don't touch the ground. They are elevated from the ground because the ground is where, the, let's say, the, the knowledge is still in there. Right? The, 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 the gravings are um, going on. So let's say the knowledge, the archaeological knowledge is underway. And for every place where a building uh, should come, uh, the gravings had to be finished first. And you see it's a steel building. It is um, half warm museum, half cold the tower. It has um, the same materialization but combined with big windows, sometimes op just openings. All the steel, which is structurally active, is painted, not rusty. All what is applied as a kind of covering is really two centimeters thick, huge iron plates. You see here the inside of the tower as a kind of um, double space, uh, vertical double spaces being stapled upon each other and the atmosphere of the museum, which is really a kind of um, installation, an exhibition installation. And all is done with different, um, different treated um, metal plates. Huh? On the left side, the, the rusty ones, on the right side, just the, the black steel, as you have seen it, by the art piece of Janis Cornelis with the, with the heat traces. There, are, there were even other like stainless steel uh, um, uh, surfaces, uh, polished, matte, and so interior and exterior was just all done in this material. And it was also, it still works quite nicely in this kind of memory of what is new and what is existing uh, um, to, uh, in, co in contrast to the nature. Another project which I quite like is, let's say, in this topic of um, material and space, is this one. This is an addition of an old building. The old building, you see it on the left side, is 
It has masonry. It's a kind of limestone masonry from a mountain area in Switzerland. There is a yellow touch in it. It has uh, quite some copper installations to bring the water down from the, uh, from the roof. And this small extension is um, cladded with huge prefabricated concrete slabs, which have as ingredients, ingredients these two components I just told, and this yellow limestone and this, um, this copper. Uh, um, and together, they, let's say, through the, through the weathering, um, you see it also in section, it's this part here, uh, in, in, the, in the plan, it's this part here, and, and here in the section, that the water of the roof is all the time just flowing over these five meter high prefabricated slabs, watering them. We made, uh, you see it here, we made different mixtures. We tested them, how the coloring is um, uh, stronger or less strong, how the yellow, uh, the, the, the yellowness of the limestone is influencing the green of the, of the copper. And, you know, that is the result. And it also, of course, when it's, when it's rainy, it's becoming quite dark, but quite intense. When it's um, dry, it, it's fading away. But it is a building which has quite a, a, a clear um, relationship to, to how this building uh, is aging. And a strong relationship through that also to the existing buildings just a, a adjacent to it. And then another building to the topic of material and space is this one which is recently finished last year, which is, you see, a tower, simple form, 80 meters high, with some shifting of the, of the volumes divided into two parts, horizontally structured, with windows uh, in the height of the, of the, of the interior rooms, uh, horizontal stripes, which giving an idea of the covering uh, of the horizontal plates and uh, all the, let's say, infrastructure you need for the climate inside. And the combination of the transparent windows, which is a kind of double windows, to this material, the cladding of the of the of the um, of the horizontal bands is uh, materialized in the way, as you see it here, in textiles. So you see that it, it is also glass, and the textiles laminated between the glass are present and also changing from side to side within these two colors. And it is interesting enough that it again works quite intensively with light. It is as material more present, of course, in the socal, but it can also, let's say, change. If you look here now, it is not so clear you know, which side is now bearing uh, the copper-like uh, hue or which, or which other one is bearing the gold. In fact, it's a kind of changing gold to copper, again to gold, and the upper part is then doing the, the contrary. Here you see the plans, you see the sections, so there is, because it has this irregular plan, there is a kind of um, bully section, right? and there is a kind of thin section, and it is also, it makes the presence of this building, which sometimes has in the view of your of your eyes, free elevation present. It is this interesting um, presence of the building, especially when you look from far, that it is sometimes, you know, two-sided, sometimes three-sided, sometimes also only one-sided. And, of course, the idea is continued inside in this double-high lobby. The third topic, color and space. This is a very nice... Um, entrance hall in Zurich, um, painted um, um, in the turning of the century, 1913, by Augusto Giacometti, 
the brother of Albert, Alberto, uh, the, the uncle of Alberto Giacometti. And you see how beautiful, you know, this color, which are, of course, flowers in a certain abstract manner, together with the arches and together with the light gives this kind of, you know, interesting relationship between space and color and how color is going against space and and how this relationship is changing and you can imagine walk through this um, through this space that it is quite a nice experience quite also visually intense experience i relate that to a project we did at the end of the 90s it is uh, in the circle of a very beautiful building. It's the University of Zurich. It's an auditorium of 600 uh, seats. And it is from outside, it is present, but in a very humble way. And in the inside, it is really very colorful. You see here the color, the, the color concept. Uh, this project and also the following we did in collaboration with uh, the painter uh, Adrian Chies, which, which, who is a, a very, uh, from the uh, same generation as we are, a very good friend and who was ready to work with us on several projects in the 90s and, and zero years. Outside, there are some indications that in the circle is somehow something happening. On one side, this huge reflecting pool, like a horizontal sculpture, uh, and on the other side, these walls, which have a kind of layering with different uh, percentages of, of, of the pigment um, uh, of, of this red color, uh, which is then becoming lighter um, with the increasing height and slowly going over to these, color, to these colors of the sandstone cladding of the existing building. And if we go inside, it has this kind of almost hilaric presence of color. And it is, of course, it, it works the best when it is completely taken by the students. As you see it here, you know, in a pause, in a, in a let's say, uh, just before uh, the start of a lesson, you see how, you know, the the natural light in the combination with the skylight, as it did the artificial light of the lamps, in combination with the artificial light of the skylight, together with the people, um, is being present and then shading away with, um, with uh, getting the, the auditorium dark for uh, uh, the, the presentation of, of the professors. And the second one is, you see a housing development, social housing for families with at least uh, three, four or five children. Uh, so social housing and horizontal st uh, stacked um, layers. And again here, we, you know, it, the situation, you see it here, there are long buildings with which are um, which, which have a, a kind of a cut in it. Also here, north is above, so it's you know the, it is um, a noisy street here. There is a beautiful park, and there is an ongoing uh, balcony situation on these sides with different depths. Uh, again here, and it was obvious that it was a kind of clear that we had to find a theme. What can we? Do with these two buildings as ongoing elevation. It's, it, there are quite long uh, elevations as an, as an answer to this, to this uh, beautiful green park. We have chosen two images, photograph, blown up photographs, have, have overlayered it um, with the elevations. You see them here as a line drawing and then um, materialize them as translucent, transparent elements, opaque elements, and this gives this kind of presence of they are sliding elements, sometimes the elements as a cladding of the elevation 
as you see it here, is fixed. And these three layers give this kind of impression you see here. And of, the, of course it changes with the daylight, also with the light in the year, with the presence of the nature, but it has quite a nice, um, almost luxurious presence, which is unusual even uh, in Switzerland for a housing, for a, for a housing development. Then another interesting topic we have, structure and space, uh, is, is, is one we unfortunately couldn't realize until now with buildings. So we forced it in our uh, teaching at the ETH. You see here an analysis of, of the Staatskantor project of OMA in Rotterdam, that is kind of three-dimensional, gridded, um, almost sculpture-like um, mountain of space which have some feet and, you know, some kind of uh, uh, silhouette with, uh, it's a quite a generic building with offices in these parts and then uh, living spaces in this part, just to understand how this building works. This model looks quite different from the built um, um, project you probably know. So we, in, in some semesters, we developed, uh, together with the students, uh, strategies um, to get to really projects which are mainly influenced by strategic visions. I just go through it, that's, you know, a kind of living tower, residential tower, and you see this kind of balancing concept of these different rooms which are shifted to each other. The whole building stands up on an industrial hall with, and, and is then routed through the uh, through the um, uh, circulation shaft, vertical circulation shaft to the ground. Here you see other examples. Here are other examples. You also made a kind of um, layout of different uh, families, of different concepts of how you could, in relationship to material, in relationship to also dimensions, um, um, articulate these uh, static-driven uh, visions. In another, um, in another course, in fact, for uh, unified uh, atelier halle for our architectural department, we made big holes in different um, uh, materials, uh, in, on different places in our campus, and they worked as a group, also with engineers, closely with engineers, also together with, with firms specialized in prefabrication of wood, uh, hybrid con uh, co uh, uh, construction of wood and metal and metal. And these are just a kind of summaries that you get an idea of, um, um, of the projects they proposed for, for this um, atelier halle. It was then also, it, 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 the project uh, came to an end that we, from each important part, let's say from this column here, or from this, uh, let's say, major element here, or from this part here, we could together, they could together with the, with the specialized firms make a mock-up one-to-one. Uh, -one. And so we had an, a kind of an exhibition uh, of mock-ups, two, three uh, meters high, which standing uh, as a kind of uh, objects side by side. Then another uh, topic which is becoming more and more important, um, the parallel times, let's say the, the presence of old and new. And of course I took here Cordoba, you know it. I think it's the best example we have in our culture, Western culture, you know, to have this mosque built up on um, ruins of a Roman um, of a Roman building and the Gothic um, cathedral, then it was taken over by the Muslims. They built their mosque um, 
then it was again uh, the Christians are, are, are were again coming back. They built this uh, cathedral within the mosque, and, and they replaced the prayer tower with a bell tower. And it is an incredible, from outside, but also from in, uh, inside, an incredible building of these parallel times. And it has precisely this quality of these parallel times. I refer to, um, to this with a project we, we did here. It is, a, it is in the center of Zurich. It is an old brewery. It is a kind of uh, central um, um, plot in, in town, uh, still quite industrial. Uh, we kept the gray buildings or the existing buildings, we kept quite a lot of it and just added what you see here in, in yellow, some vertical parts and also some parts we put up on the old structure or added to the old structure. And you see, you know, you see this kind of intersection, you can have an idea of this kind of interchange of existing vertical tower, can delivering over the old, um, then again an old building having an addition, staircase addition, new, or up on an old building adding uh, a new part, a new floor, this kind of interweaving of the old and the new. And you see in here, it is, it is quite a beautiful presence of this a uh, known brewery architectural style huh, of the late 19th century, and then added these this vertical buildings, cladded with ceramic tiles, sometimes as this one, um, visible white concrete. And the quality of this project, I'm really convinced, is this ensemble of the new and the old, and we never would have found let's say, these new buildings without this uh, continuing um, exchange, interchange, also challenge with what the new, uh, the, the old architecture told us. So this is the Kunsthalle, a museum, which was extended from the old part to with a new uh, building put up on the old structure with big windows. You see here these residential parts with courtyard buildings and then a kind of tower apartments above um, having enough surface through this cantilevering up, um, above this uh, existing structure. Or as a third building, as a kind of orientated to the, to the center of the, of the city, uh, of an office tower, just making the end of this row of of um, horizontal extended um, uh, existing building and then having this as a kind of answer also to the fire ducts of the drains. And here you see you know, how silos and chimneys together with the existing building makes this kind of close relationship between old and new. Another topic, elevations expressions of buildings, tectonics. This is a model, you know it, Palazzo Rucellai from Alberti, which was for, is still for us a very important um, building because it works with stucco on a very um, delicate level uh, in the same material, uh, giving the palazzo a very nice uh, proportion, and a, a very nice um, a division of, of, uh, of different layers and all done with stucco, with the same materials uh, and, and, and having, let's say, quite different topics, themes than when the natural light is modulating the elevation. I'm referring to this with a complex of housing. We also just finished uh, last year. Eight buildings in a row, two elevated buildings at the end with quite a tectonically uh, formulated elevations. Um, I think it's uh, interesting, or let's say that 
the, the, the plan of these additional buildings sometimes being um, in very small common surfaces put together, shifted uh, slightly to, to, the, to the other one, forming two uh, street elevations here and here, and having then uh, courtyards, more closed, more opens. That is the quality of, of the project itself, with different heights, and all unified with this kind of very tectonic formulated um, uh, elevations, with prefabricated elements in light concrete or in uh, prefabricated stucco ele stuccoed elements. Inside, and you also see here how it is then formulated in the corners, how the surfaces of the materials varying you know, from the main frames to the infills to the windows. And of course, it's, it's, it's very, it has very close references to, to buildings uh, you probably also know. Another important um, topic, the presence of one building as this tower here in Lucca to a city, to a community. And you know the history of these towers. They were built by wealthy families to express their powers. These trees, these oak trees on the top of these towers were a kind of holy trees, you know, to, to, to give them a kind of, a kind of uh, symbolism which is similar uh, to church towers. And it is clear that, you know, the towers is without any use if the, uh, the city, if the let's say, the, uh, all the buildings all around wouldn't be there, and the city itself gets quite some quality with the presence of this tower. And I refer to this with the prime tower, with an office tower we built here, also in relationship to the city of Zurich. And of course, it's not the only tower. There are a lot of towers now coming up in different sizes, but it is still... Uh, quite a significant building for the city and um, it works on different levels um, in the perception of how foreigners are coming to the city and you know and how this tower is coming together with here the tower of the university towers of uh, churches uh, industrial towers like uh, this, this, the silos you see here and, you know, how is this tower now designed and how is it in relationship to the ground where it, where it is standing and is it reasonable? Uh, you see here the development of the volumes. You see that it is not only the tower itself, but it is a group of buildings. It stands quite close to infrastructure, rain, ra railroad tracks, a kind of ring street on columns. And it has, again, a quite a distinguished shape which reacts to different sides. It is cladded with glass, green glass. The glass can move every second or third X. Every second or third glass panel can move forward. And through the kind of differentiation, through the modulation of the volume, it changes its presence together with the light in relationship on which height you look at the tower. It's a little bit similar to the other tower you saw. It has a thin section, a wider section. It has this free shaped floor plan. It has this presence, this carefully uh, let's say, designed um, uh, infrastructure on the ground for the public entrances, but also a lot of public functions. Uh, it has these rooms, um, these uh, office floors, which have different um, depths, different uh, presences to the city, with different views. And this kind of possibility of not only being a kind of closed glass wall, but also having the possibility of open um, uh, uh, some panels to get fresh air. That, is, that means that it is, 
it, uh, it has a kind of um, aim to get to a high sustainability also um, as, a, as a glazed, as a completely glazed building. A completely other building, also again in this theme from one building relationship to the city, is this um, university building in Paris. You see it here. It is in the Plateau Sacle in the south of Paris, about half an hour from the center, where all the universities are rebuilding their new campuses. And this is now one of them, it's Ecole Centrale Supélec. It is uh, a plan by OMA. There is a building just beside it, OMA. There is an existing building. There are um, here student houses. This is already again finished as a block. So it's a, a, a complete new campus, but the buildings in itself is, because they are so horizontal and so big, worlds, um, which can function quite well in itself. So this, this is a, the diagram between the two major buildings of Ecole Centrale, eh? the, the one of OMA, the one of us, with, with a kind of similar concepts of public spaces inside, which are uh, important to link and to uh, the different usages, but also to reinforce the, let's say, the uh, uh, the presence of a uh, public in interaction and change. This is more gridded, this is more conceived as a, as a kind of uh, sequence of squares and streets, wider streets, narrower streets, with an open pasture, with an open piece of nature in the middle. You see it's organized on three levels. The public atmosphere is going up on the first level, and then partly also on the third level, but it is mainly, um, of course, present on the, on the ground floor on the first level. And it is quite, let's say there is a, a kind of balance between the gray and the yellow, between the actual spaces, auditoriums, workshop areas, classrooms, offices, to what the public uh, area is where there are a lot of activities, studying, uh, teaching, um, and you see the atmosphere here. In the open space, you see it here, here, and in the outside, again, the building is put together um, by different parts but formulated with, a, with the same language, with the same elements uh, of the grammatic. And again, materialized with ceramic tiles in different forms. So there is, you know, the entrance here. You, 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 you see this, what we saw before here. Huh? And then the street, a hotel built above, let's say, the horizontal line of the school with other entrances to the street, but also uh, to this side here, to this square here. It looks like this. It has a, uh, a relation to the, to the nature and it has a relation to the street. Then the last one, density. I think it's also in Russia quite an important uh, topic. And I will show now, um, related to this theme, three projects we just did last year and this year. Uh, three high-rises, hybrid high-rises in terms of uh, living but also co-working with public uh, uh, functions on the on the on the ground floor and what is you know it's the sizes are all the time the same of the towers between 60 70 80 90 meters high 
which which have a, which has a, a certain vision, a, a certain um, uh, topic uh, of the of the typology, but also how they stand uh, in relationship to the city, and also how they are organized internally in this exchange between the different functions. So here you see it's it's quite a dense organized. Um, floor plan, quite big, and it has different groups of apartments which are then being visible in the volume itself and which gives this kind of modulation uh, you, see, you see in this model. The section is important in terms that, let's say, the the common rooms are not only present on the ground floor, but also being present on different heights. There is a kind of an elevated garden above a big uh, shopping space. And there is this um, uh, kind of both, um, uh, let's say, the living atmosphere to the communal atmosphere and to the public atmosphere you have on the ground floor. Another one, I think with almost the same, uh, let's say, program, 80 meters high, is dominated by a structure. A structure which is quite regular on the upper floors and then coming down to a less present structure on the, on the, on the, in the Sokol area to the ground floor. It is a plan uh, which is almost centralized in a square as a major uh, core and as a kind of in-between space from the inner, from the inside to the, out uh, to the outside space where the structure is present in, forms from, in, in form of uh, round columns and curtains. And then coming down to these V-shaped uh, elements to this bigger column on the ground floor. And again, there is a kind of, you know, presence of what, uh, in which kind of rooms you live, uh, with this um, outside uh, balcony in different depths, in different quality of of, um, of usage, and the presence of these spaces here, of the co-working areas above the ground floor. Or the last one, this um, high-rise, about 60 meters high, which has a kind of division of a sockle area, which is the co-working space with shops, and has a kind of, you know, addition of pillars, which are, in fact, rooms, and the in-between spaces of the living area, and which gives then in the let's say, silhouette of the town, a kind of um, small towers just uh, being present beside each other. Uh, that it is like a bundle of, of uh, um, columns which are in fact uh, stapled rooms. Together with a sockle, with an inner space, which links these kind of co-working spaces, which you see here visualized with quite generic floor plans and the very defined, very precise floor plan of how this, let's say, sequence of different spaces have um, the in-between more freer from mostly two-side orientated, two-side enlightened spaces of the living zones. So these are the themes which we are now uh, quite often busy in the office because Switzerland has also a grow of, of population, especially in the big towns. And let's say the, 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 the buildings 25, 30 meters high are not enough anymore. So at, at certain points, um, uh, let's say the, 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 type, the typology of the high rises is a challenge. As a last slide, I would like to show you this. That's the result of the research we do at the ETH. 
Okay, you see there's a book, residential towers, library buildings, office buildings. And it is, in a way, the, let's say, the, the outcome of how we structure our design uh, ateliers, design courses. It is a, a kind of compilation here, 80, here 40, here 50 examples for, of, of buildings we, we like a lot in the different typologies. We try to present them as precise as possible described, uh, also documented with plans and photographs, as you see it, for instance, here, as, as a kind of common ground, a common base of the discussion then on the project. And often we do models then about these buildings, often we do a kind of modi modi uh, exercise of modi modifications uh, to have this kind of slowly going over to a project which then can become a, a personal project but still related to this world of these compilations which are of course personal but are let's say the the common ground of the discussion uh, in the design semester. I have the books here and I would like uh, I would like to give them to your school to your library. Thank you. and to your students. Thanks. Thank you.